Let's get into the show, everyone. It is time to start off with our interview. We're going to be speaking with Dr. Kathleen Lutz, the head of the Mouse Models Repository at the Jackson Laboratory. Uh, she is also senior research scientist, and in her laboratory, she focuses on modeling human neurodegenerative disease in mice, emphasizing optimum use and best practices for research and preclinical drug testing. Uh, she works with the NIH and multiple disease foundations to improve existing mouse models, identify modifier genes, and generate new models that will facilitate therapeutic development. The perfect person to be speaking with. Kat, thank you so <laughs> much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. You are so welcome. So I reached out to the Jackson Laboratory because Justin here said, we talk about lab mice all the time. We're constantly mm -hmm. talking about what about either stress in lab mice or results of experiments with lab mice, lab rats, etc. Mm -hmm. And a World Lab Day came up and we thought, what a great opportunity to actually try and elucidate some of these processes and procedures that go on kind of that seem like magic to everyone <laughs> who benefits from yeah. the research that comes out of it. Um, so how did you get into working on mouse genetics in the first place? Oh boy, uh, that's going back many, many years. Um, I, I really did cut my teeth on um, working with mouse models of, of different diseases, but in a very different way than we do today. Um, you know, 25 years ago, um, when I was a student, we didn't necessarily have a lot of the genetic engineering techniques that we have now. So we used to rely on spontaneous um, mutations in the very large mouse colonies at the Jackson Laboratory. And so um, when you're breeding all of these mice, um, eventually you'll have a spontaneous mutation that occurs, just like sometimes it happens in a human population. And you'll usually be able to see that visibly. So sometimes the mice would have uh, a neurological disorder. They might be a little ataxic. They may be walking. They may have um, a wasting disorder. A lot of them were the ones that we could visibly see. You know, their tails were crooked. Their ears were um, bigger or smaller. There was a coat color mutation. And so all of those things that we could see um, and at the time, what we could do is we could look at that, the phenotype of those mice, but what we could see. And, um, you know, sometimes they were really related to the diseases that we were studying. Maybe the mice were obese, um, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and then we would sort of work backwards from the phenotype and say, okay, can we identify the gene? Um, and that took a long time. I think that actually was... Um, you know, part of my, a large part of my PhD thesis um, in took the better part of six years. And now you can probably do that in a summer, <laughs> you know, a couple weeks with a good summer student. Um, so is that, uh, is, that all, is that all because of technology now? Just the, yeah. the, everything is just so much, it's computerized or yeah, I standardized? Yeah, um, it's the technology, I think, um, with any, um, area, whether it's it's biology or science or, you know, computers, there's always um, some very big disruptive innovations, you know, things that happen in the field, discoveries, inventions, technologies that completely change the way we we do our work and we we, we monitor our, our, our progress and, and, and the way we do science. And for um, a long time, it was, um, you know, this is sort of the genetics approaches, those spontaneous mutations that I was just telling you about. And then in the early 90s, um, genetic engineering really changed with embryonic stem cells and the ability to do genetically engineered um, mice in a way that you could target a particular gene, any particular gene that you wanted. And that was huge. And for a long time, um, we used those embryonic stem cells and those genetic engineering techniques in mice you know, to really drive forward and, and manipulate the genes that we wanted to interrogate. So if we knocked out that gene, what would happen? If we made that particular gene a null or introduced a point mutation, what would happen? And then we could study the disease mechanisms that way. Right, yeah, when I was in, uh, in grad school in the 90s, or yeah, 
late 90s, early 2000s, there was a lot of the knock-in and knock-out work that right. was being done. Um, yeah. And one of the questions there that I've always found really interesting is the, I guess, the, the off-target effects of uh, on the phenotype. So you knock out a gene expecting to have a certain, say, cognitive effect or behavioral effect. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, what other effects does stuff like that have on the mm -hmm. health of a mouse? Right. So that's a really good question and it's a really good point um, because mice aren't humans and humans aren't mice and there's a, a lot of uh, years of evolution between between mice and humans and so while the genes are conserved and the proteins are conserved and we learn a lot about you know maybe the regulation of a particular gene, the pathways and the proteins that it interacts with, you know there are some times where we get results in mice that we don't quite expect. Um, sometimes that actually is very enlightening because if you're always looking under the street lamp, you're only going to find what's under the street lamp. Right. And so when um, we do make a knockout or a mutation in a mouse and it doesn't necessarily do what we think it's going to do, that's just, you know, really, you know, sometimes people would think, well, that's really unfortunate. But in the end of the day, it really just tells us more about that gene or more about that protein or more about that disease that we just didn't know before. So. Hmm. It's a big, it's discovery. I mean, and that's what yeah. science is. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting way to think of it. Um, I've, I come from the behavior side of things, and so it's always the, oh, well, that didn't have the behavioral effect that we wanted. But then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> behavior in mice is, is hard, you know. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's an art, I, I like to think of it. It's not as straightforward as people, you know, like to think, and there's all kinds of things that affect your experiments, as you know. Absolutely. Um, so I guess from a historical perspective, um, we started out, as you said, kind of going just from genetic, natural genetic mutations and using mm -hmm. those animals and into this manipulation of embryonic stem cells, knocking in, mm -hmm. knocking out. Um, how has this affected how many strains of mice there are? Yeah, can, so actually, there... This is, this is, I, I sort of a picture, especially <laughs> with the CRISPR-Cas9, that now there's orders pouring in from everywhere to get okay. this specific thing. And I sort of pictured, like, well, do they have to open another warehouse? Because there's these pages <laughs> that they have to keep putting up everywhere. And I suppose some of it is, is like that, although I guess the ability to do knockouts and do specific things and not have to sort of wait for the manifestation of an obese mouse to just sort of present itself within the population and start to do the breeding mm -hmm. that way, um, you, you at the same time can get all these other papers that researchers would have loved to have worked on if they had a model, but now there's a way to get that model. Yeah. And, and you still have to do uh, a fair amount of breeding and sort of still isolating that from that breeding pool, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not as easy as like, okay, we've knocked out the gene and these two mice, and now they'll start the population, yeah. and off it goes. All those mice are exactly mm -hmm. what we want. How does right. that work? How, do, how does that process of you start with, we're going to knock out a gene, and how do we find the samples that we actually want to send to the researcher? Well, I think, you know, the interesting thing, since you brought up the CRISPR-Cas9, I'll just, you know, touch on that briefly because, um, you know, that technology is the, disrupt, the disruptive innovation, you know, that we were just talking about. It completely changes the way we do our work, how we approach science, how we approach um, therapeutic testing as well. So it's orders of magnitude easier with CRISPR-Cas9 than it ever was with embryonic stem cells. Um, embryonic stem cells, you know, were good, um, but you lost efficiency along the way. You lost efficiency in the targeting process. You lost efficiency in the germline transmission and the percentage of chimeras and then if you were so lucky as to get a correctly targeted mouse then you would have to breed out the selection markers and, and a lot of other things that went with it. With CRISPR-Cas9 you can you know really have your founder lines in one in, in one generation um, you know instead of a year and so the time that it, that it takes to, to do those experiments has been greatly reduced and so of course the cost has been greatly reduced and now you can do you know a lot more um, with the same amount of money um, when it comes to the targeting so that's really really exciting and I also think it opens up more possibilities because with embryonic stem cells you know we were um, 
really um, restricted a lot by the genetic backgrounds that we could work with because we just never got past with embryonic stem cells that, you know, there are just particular strains of mice where you could make embryonic stem cells that would be germline competent, but others would not. And, you know, we just never got over that efficiency. But now with CRISPR-Cas9, we can go into any genetic background of any mouse that we want um, and, and make these... Um, you know, very, very efficiently. So that's, you know, extremely exciting. And so, of course, now this whole playground opens up of all those things that you wanted to do, but, you know, either didn't have the technology to do um, or the time or the money was was a little consuming. Um, but, you know, in that respect, I think that you still have to think very carefully about the um, models that you're doing and what you're making because, um, you know, sometimes you'll find your answer in a different model organism. Maybe you'll use um, zebrafish or flies or even maybe even do a cell-based assay. That can provide you with a lot of information. Um, so you have to think about the temptation about going right into the mammalian system, right into the mouse. Um, it's there and it's easy to do and it's great. But, you know, there will be a bottleneck down the road. Um, and that will be the space, you know, you mentioned we have to build more warehouses. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I think we do. Um, but it's also money, too, because you still have to see the types of mice. You still have to do a really thorough investigation about exactly what's going on in that system um, because you don't want to miss anything and you don't want to jump to erroneous conclusions. And as we all know, um, you know, reproducibility and being able to replicate these results mm -hmm. are incredibly important. So you do have to you know, think very thoughtfully about what it is you're doing um, and, and what the goal is, uh, especially in light of, you know, this huge, like I said, almost a playground in front of you. There's too many things and too many experiments that you so, want to do. So is it, is it, are the orders up? I mean, are you getting, are you getting many, many, many more requests for, for I mean, I can imagine that there's a, a laundry list of researchers out there who had a study they would love to have done if it was possible to have the model, but now that it is, are they getting funded? Are they getting uh, the go the green light to do their research, the grants, and then calling mm -hmm. you? So that is going. There, it's a it's a definite uptick. So I think, um, yeah, it, it definitely has. There's there's a lot more um, interest than we 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 might have had before. Um, because of this new technology. But then the other part of it is you pair it with the other innovative technology, and that's genome sequencing. Um, and not that the sequencing of a genome is necessarily innovative, um, but because now the cost of sequencing a genome, or an, even a whole exome sequencing, um, has gone down, that means now we can start to interrogate these patient populations in ways that we didn't before. Um, you know, think about diseases like um, Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, um, all of these diseases where if we used to have a loved one diagnosed with, with that disease, um, you know, we would do our best to care for that patient um, and that family member. But it wasn't necessarily the case that clinicians would try to um, gather these patients um, and try to sequence their genomes or their exomes to try to understand exactly what the pathogenic variant in their genome would be. And now they're doing that, and they're doing that with, with a great deal of success. And so once you've identified the pathogenic variant in the human population, of course, modeling that um, you know, particular mutation in another mammalian system that you can manipulate more um, is, is very powerful. Yeah, it just unlocks all of all the ability to actually research and look for things that are that are preventative measures. Now it's not then it's not even the question so much of how is this happening. It's how do we actually now take that next step and prevent or deal with it or create a therapy for mm -hmm. it. Awesome. Can you tell me a little bit about the Jackson Laboratory Rare and Orphan Disease Center? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, so this is a, a part of the organization that um, we thought very hard about, um, especially because of these two different technologies. Um, most of rare and orphan diseases um, are monogenic in nature, and that usually just means that they are um, caused by a single gene. And so if we do have the ability now to do this kind of genome editing, 
um, for these single gene mutations, we now have the ability um, to help a population that may have gone um, um, essentially with an unmet need, you know, huge unmet need because the patient population is so small. And there have been some other, um, you know, really interesting developments in rare and orphan diseases, and that is that the FDA and the government and um, have gotten together and really have put some incentives in front of biotech and pharmaceutical companies um, to allow them to hold patents for longer to get accelerated approval for therapeutics. And when you're a biotech company, especially, um, you know, having those kinds of intellectual property and in those patents um, is going to, you know, be what makes or breaks you, you know, as a company and allows you to move forward. So being able to um, um, I don't want to use the word capitalize because I don't think that that's the right word, but you know, so much investment goes into biotech and pharmaceutical companies, um, and most of that at the end of the day is is not a, a widget or a gadget, it's, it's intellectual property, and so they need to be able to um, you know, profit from that in some way that they can go back and reinvest those dollars in the next disease that they want to. Um, they want to, to, to look for therapies for. And so I think that, um, you know, the Rare and Orphan Disease Center at Jax, you know, what we really want to be able to do um, is help those disease populations, you know, those patients, those groups, you know, with this huge unmet need um, where we can provide those resources to the biomedical community. Um, we can work with pharmaceutical companies, we can work with biotech companies, so that at least they have the starting materials in the form of the mice with the proper genetic mutations and the precise genetic mutations as well. Um, and then they can start to interrogate whether or not their therapeutic, um, you know, is really going to um, have an effect um, or not. And then right. once they get a preclinical indication, you know, that gives them um, and their investors and the FDA a lot more confidence in moving forward with the clinical trial. Yeah, and then and then not that it, uh, I maybe I misheard, but um, you're not also uh, raising orphans for research. Right? That, <laughs> that this is not, no, but um, but that's got to be a, I mean that's got to be a huge obstacle. If there's only you know if there's only a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand or could be even a hundred thousand really in the global mm -hmm. population that's affected at any given time by a particular uh, mutation or disease, uh, you're not going to get a biotech to pour uh, billions of dollars into just those people. So there does need to be a way for research to be done in that to see, yeah, and then to see if there's already a therapy out there. There could already be a therapy out there that's already right. existing uh, mm -hmm. that's effective on it. So that's mm -hmm. a brilliant, uh, a brilliant benefit Jax is uh, yeah. applying that. And I think the other thing that, you know, while we seem to think of, um, you know, of these diseases, they're rare and orphan diseases, maybe they only affect, you know, a couple hundred people in the population or maybe a couple um, thousand people in the population at any one given time, a lot of these diseases will have very common underlying mechanisms and very common then therapeutic strategies. And so right. while you're only going after one particular gene or one particular disease, the underlying mechanisms or the application of a particular therapeutic like an antisensitive like a nucleotide or gene therapy, um, while you're only solving maybe that one particular disease today, you're opening yourself up, you know, for a whole suite of, of, of different diseases that may have an application with your drug or therapeutic. And quick question, uh, that reminds me too, like we, when we were talking about how the, the stem cell uh, use was like yeah, it was hit and miss, but you learned other things from sort of that process. Is CRISPR uh, giving us that same sort of look, or or is it is it not giving as much a, a, of uh, uh, of an idea of what else is being affected in parallel? Yeah. I think it's giving us um, a huge look, um, and I, and I think that. Um, so we mentioned therapeutics that you know might be able to cure a disease, but we also talked about. Um, things that could prevent a disease. And so one of the things that we're always interested in when we make a mouse model, um, so for example, we have some mouse models of, of Lou Gehrig's disease, for example, where the mice are, are very susceptible, you know, to, to that disease and they get motor neuron degeneration. And 
um, you know, maybe behave classically like we would consider a motor neuron, and we think, well, that's a really great disease model because then we can test therapeutics in it. But what's even more interesting is the mouse, when you put that same mutation in, in a different strain or a different genetic background, it doesn't get the disease. And so now you're saying, okay, why is this mouse succumbing, you know, to the disease, but this other mouse isn't? And it's the same thing for the patient population, right? Um, it may be, uh, a mutation may be um, necessary, but not sufficient to cause a disease. And there could be, of course, environmental triggers, but mm -hmm. when you're looking at a mouse model that's, you know, the mice are genetically identical, the patients aren't, um, obviously. And they're um, also yeah. all in this basically identical laboratory mouse environment. Right. Yeah. We control which is, the environment. Yeah. Which, mm -hmm. which is, this is, this is all, I mean, I don't want to preempt this, this part, but th this is something that's been coming up more and more is, is actually the environment in which mm -hmm. mice are kept and affecting the outcomes of research. Yeah, I was uh, going to ask what temperature you keep your mice at since yeah, we talked about that last week. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, if a lab has a better result uh, because they have classical music playing. Sure. Uh, for the mice, is, uh, it seems like that's actually in itself, it sounds like, oh, great, they got a better result. But it's actually kind of disastrous uh, mm -hmm. to think about if they're the only ones doing it and it's mm -hmm. giving an artificially high mm -hmm. result yeah. from that lab. Uncontrolled variables. Uncontrolled variables. So how much mm -hmm. effort is gone in, is going in uh, to controlling these, uh, uh, what you were just saying, uh, keeping that environment yeah. controlled? Yeah, so we're very, um, we're very aware of those kinds of um, effects and how they can really derail um, everybody's research and confuse the literature and, you know, was that a real result or will it, you know, wasn't. And, you know, I think the important thing to remember is that um, in cases where you can't reproduce somebody's results, um, it's not necessarily the case. In fact, it's very, you know, often not the case or very rare that that person is just being fraudulent, right? They're not making up their data. Um, they're not you know, trying to get a nature paper, you know, come hell or high water. Right. Um, you know, I, I do I do believe, I think we're all in agreement that the results they got at the time that they got them, you know, were real. Um, and so there's a lot of things that can, it's the environment, it could be the reagents that they were using um, at the time. So a lot of people do is when we get mice at, into the Jackson Laboratory, if it's a, for example, a behavioral phenotype or something that we may think may be highly variable or a little bit persnickety, you know, depending on, you know, what person's hands they're in, we'll do a second site validation. You know, we'll get those mice in and we'll say, did we see the same exact thing? Um, and most of the time we do, and some very subtle phenotypes, we may not necessarily see it, but we allow people to um, understand what we saw. And of course, this all comes out in the literature eventually anyway, if it doesn't come out at you know, people at meetings just talking about, oh, I couldn't reproduce that part, but I could reproduce this part. Um, and I think at the end of the day, those phenotypes and, and the things that are going to be the most robust, you know, are going to sort of rise to the top. And we may have to just let some of those very variable um, portions um, go. But I think the consideration to try to have the most reproducible results that you can have, you know, right from the beginning, making sure that you're experiments are powered the way that they should be, that they're statistically um, being conducted and blinded and controlled and mm -hmm. um, you know, just making sure that we're not introducing that variability um, in ways that are not appropriate. Great. Did you see the story last week about um, temperatures with uh, lab animals and that maybe yeah. these, these mice were too cold? What did, did you right. have any ideas yeah. about that? Well, I mean, certainly um, there's a lot of anecdotal information um, out there from, you know, the sex of the animal caretaker um, mm -hmm. to the temperature of the mouse room right. um, to really, you know, what noise is going on in the mouse room, which probably makes a little bit more sense. Um, mm -hmm. But then there's also um, variables, you know, some people will say, well, don't put the, the cages on the top rack if you really want them to breed because there could be... Um, you know, something about the, the lights. And so there's, there's a lot of different, um, you know, but there are so many different variables when it comes to that. Um, but I do think um, we 
there is a lot more room for those kind of animal husbandry types of experiments and you know just because we're comfortable at that temperature doesn't mean the mice are comfortable at that temperature um, and there's also again a strain by strain cases that some of the mice actually like to be a little crowded you know they actually do better um, when there's more mice in the cage but for other strains they don't like that at all and they they do a little bit worse if you, you know if you're measuring reproductive performance and so does, does a recent I mean so do you you have these instructions then um, if somebody is going to be ordering your mice like you know do not overcrowd this one this is going to change sort of the viability of your experiment <laughs> if you've got them over I mean do they get like a little a Don't little feed list. them after midnight. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you never get them wet. <laughs> right. do, yeah. do they get this sort of rundown of what to and not to do? Well, I think um, for most people, their animal husbandry is dictated by their animal care and use committee. Um, and so their veterinarians and their staff will dictate what they think is an appropriate housing condition. And there are, you know, international guidelines along these um, along these types but other people will say oh you know as soon as the female mouse has a litter you should remove the male because it stresses them out right well you know maybe in some strains maybe not in others but we just find that if you do that you just miss the next estrus cycle and you've just lost a round of breeding and so um, but other people feel again um, you know do you provide enrichment to the mouse do you give them toys to play with um, those are the kind of things that actually really introduce those environmental factors that can yeah. really change your, your results. And that's, and that's my concern, too, is that if we don't have uh, some sort of a standard in place, mm -hmm. uh, and there's international standards, but it's not, I'm, not, I'm not really talking about the just basic animal husbandry of the situation, but something like this wheel that you introduce for the uh -huh. mice, but, right? something like this. Um, and if and if and if you have found out that if you keep it cold and there's no wheel, you'll get a much lower results, which you might mm -hmm. then use if you're trying to prove the negative. And right. then, uh, hey, if you really want the high number result, let's get the wheel in here. Let's crank the temperature up to 72 degrees. Let's put the classical music on in the background, yeah. and yeah. we'll avoid the top cage. Yeah. Okay. Right. Like it seems like it, the standard needs to be something like this. Like let's, ha I mean, if they're all going to be in a cold room, let's keep them all in a cold room, and that's the standard mm -hmm. or whatever that is. Make it a minimum, or, or like a, right. there should be a maximum standard too of, of yeah. the type of mm -hmm. care and entertainment they're getting. Otherwise, it does seem like you're 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 fix or uh, tweaking your result, whether in, unintentionally or not. Yeah, I think that you know, again, you. You know, so you can control those things, and I and I do think that most people, for for the most part, they do. Um, we have, like I said, the 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 ALAC guide of um, for animal care and husbandry um, that basically sort of set the norm. Um, like, so if you have a singly housed animal, you need to provide them with enrichment. That's pretty standard and uniform across all institutions. Um, as is, you know, the way that we handle the mice and the cage changing and, and things like that. But the other part of it is there are other factors that are likely to be much larger than that that we can't necessarily control for. So maybe it is your reagents. Maybe it is the food that you're feeding, you know, the, the animals. And so, and even though in the chow that we give our animals, the, you know, protein and the fat content is controlled for, you know what's going on with the way that wheat was stored or that corn was stored that year could introduce, um, you know, a higher or lower level of riboflavins or aflatoxins or something along those lines. And then let's not forget the microbiome and the, you know, mm -hmm. the pathogens and the opportunistics that, um, you know, if you try to exclude every single um, organism and have, you know, just this. Uh, you know, pathogen-free animal, um, and we're not talking about bad pathogens, we're right. just talking they would, about... They would be animals, dead. Right? They would all die. They'd exactly. be unable to digest their food. Exactly. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. And so I really think those microbiome experiments are really going to be, you know, interesting. So we can control for, and we should control for, the environment as much as we possibly can and standardize. But at the end of the day, I think there are going to be a multitude of factors, and we're just going to have to... Um, you know, we're going to have to do our best to control for it and make sure that we're running the proper controls in our experiments because, you know, you may not be able to get exactly the same, you know, result that the other person got. But between your experimental group and your control group, 
you know, you should have, you know, you should be seeing the same, maybe not value, but the same end result anyway. Yeah. And is, do you think it's, is, is it more on the, um, you know, on, on the researchers who want to run particular studies to determine the exact strain of mice that they want to use and then based mm -hmm. on that strain determine all these factors that we're talking about, whether or not they should be housed in a group or housed individually? Yeah, I think, you know, um, for the genetically engineered animals, we've been a, a little bit, as I mentioned, um, constrained to maybe C57 black 6 or 129 or the common inbred strains. And so um, in a lot of ways, you know, we have a, a small number of genetic backgrounds with a large number of mutations that are introduced onto them. And so mm -hmm. um, by and large, you know, they can change from one mutation to the other, but most C57 black 6 mice, you know, regardless of the mutations that they're carrying, and that's a huge generality, obviously it's not a, a rule, um, you know, will give you the same litter size, you know, the females still don't like to be disturbed, you know, just leave them alone, let them have their babies and do their job, and you know, you'll have a lot more mice at the end of the day. Um, you know, whereas if you keep, you know, poking your head in the cage and looking to see how they're doing, they're going to get a little stressed out and not like that. Some um, models um, and some strains are, are much more sensitive to those kinds of um, variables than others. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you just have to, you have to know your mice, and we certainly provide as much information um, as we can. You know, we have a whole database and a, and a whole group of technical information support specialists, you know, who will tell you, um, if, you know, if your experiments aren't working or your mice aren't breeding or things aren't happening the way you think that they should, you know, we'll give you the benefit of, you know, the 75 or 8 years or more of experience that we've accumulated at the lab and pass that on. Someone in the chat room, Ed from Connecticut, is um, asking, to what degree could modeling, computer modeling even, replace working with live animals? Is this something that, um, as computer models become more and more sophisticated, is this, is this yeah. a direction that it, Jackson Lab, is Jackson Lab working on this stuff as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that to not take advantage of the computational sciences and the, and the computational network biology, we know so much more about the systems and pathways than we did before. So to not be using that kind of computational biology, um, you know, um, I don't really know, you know, institutions or universities that don't incorporate that, you know, into their science. It's just you know, another way of doing science, it's, it's computer modeling and it's, it's, you certainly still have to test those hypotheses at some level. And um, you also really still have to, you have to fill in all that data that they're modeling in the first place. I mean, this is, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, this is, I think what his point is, this actually becomes more useful if you're considering uh, running some research and would be able to go into a database and find that not only has this been modeled or this experiment been run once or twice mm -hmm. or three times, and you might still mm -hmm. want to run it yourself, but the computer model can show you what those results are based on three or four disparate studies that all sort of touched exactly. on the same gene. But you, a you absolutely have to have done the actual real-world research in the first place, otherwise you have nothing to create that model on. <laughs> That's very true, um, but I also think, you know, just to add to that, you do have, you know, these databases that um, have, you know, all of these really great um, computational software behind them. So, for example, if I wanted to make a particular mutation because I thought, well, well, we saw this, you know, allelic variant in humans and we think it's going to be pathogenic. Hey, let's make it in mouse. Um, well, before I do that, you know, I'm going to look at the level of the sequence and the genomics and the transcriptome and I'm going to see if there's cryptic splice variants that exist in the mouse or the human that don't exist, you know, um, in the other organism or vice versa. And so, you know, you have to take into account, I think, a, a lot of those changes and, you know, certainly the network um, the networking um, of, of genes and proteins and pathways that you can get is really, really interesting. And again, though, you're right. At, you know, sometimes it'll tell you the experiment not to do. Sometimes it'll tell you the experiment that you think is going to strengthen your hypothesis, but then you, know, you really do have to do the experiment as well. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of um, computational uh, genomics that is predictive as well, so mm -hmm. being able to 
give you give you a better guess as to where right. to look than you would have otherwise. Yeah, and that's really um, a lot of what the the Jackson Laboratory and the Connecticut facility. So we're talking a lot about the mice and the genetic engineering that goes on um, in the Bar Harbor campus um, for sure. But we have facilities in in Sacramento and in in Connecticut is our um, is our is our latest campus which we just opened um, that really takes advantage of the genomics um, and leverages um, what we know about the sequence and the genomics to to really do science in ways that are much different than we used to do it before. So, from your position um, working in neurodegenerative diseases and also in these rare and orphan diseases and kind of seeing the the CRISPR technology come in and disrupt. Um, do you have any, um, I guess, any any thoughts on where you where you think lab mouse genetics is going to be going in the near future? Yeah, I think it's it's going to be um, you know better. Um, having just worked in um, spinal muscular atrophy for the last decade or so. Um, you know, working with those mouse models from the ground up, you know, doing a lot of that work in embryonic stem cells, and now seeing uh, at what pace we can accelerate that. Now that we have the models, and now that those resources are more accessible to the scientific community, I think a lot of that preclinical work will go faster. Um, we'll, I, I think as a community, we'll be more inclined to collaborate and form consortia that will help us um, solve these problems faster um, because I think the days of you know one mouse in one lab you know the lab that studies this particular mouse mutation for the last five years you know those days are over um, and and that's good I think it's a really good thing because we need to move beyond you know just creating the resources we need to be um, you know moving towards using those resources and the applications, you know, that we need to get for these therapeutics um, that we just really, um, and, and, and they're there and they're possible. I mean, for spinal muscular atrophy, I mean, I never really thought when I started working in that 10 years ago that we would have drugs and clinical trials that really, um, you know, were as powerful as, as they look to be at this point. Um, but they're there, and I think with this new technology, um, for these other rare and orphan diseases, I think we're just going to get there much, much faster. Um, and, and that's an optimistic, I mean, I think it's, and I am optimistic about it, um, because I do think it's going to happen, but it doesn't necessarily mean um, that there's not a lot of work to do, you know, still behind it. It just makes, you know, the job a, a little bit easier, but there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. And then I guess, finally, to, to ask as we uh, end, end the interview, um, so World Lab Animal Day, we can, uh, you know, take a take a moment to think about all the animals that help mm -hmm. us to do to come up with our therapeutic treatments, to come up with our understanding of the human body, of the animal body systems, how mm -hmm. how it all works, and how we can fix it when it's broken. Um, I mean, do you, do you do you see a day? I mean, do you think at at any point in the future will we will we know enough to get rid of the animal models, or is the mm -hmm. is the lab animal is the lab animal is it something that we should we should respect and understand and ac accept that we're going to be working with it for a long time to come? Well, I think for sure um, we'll be using um, animals in research. I think um, just from the standard that you know we're not ethically going to conduct these experiments in humans. Um, right. You know, we're just we're just not. Um, but to your point, I think you know the idea of and and we do this now. I mean, I think every researcher I know in the United States and Europe and around the world are incredibly cognizant of the um, care of the animals, the how many animals we're using. We certainly, you know, the three R's with the, the reduction of the animals is, is very much in, um, in, the, in the forefront of our minds. We don't want to be using animals unnecessarily in, in the research, whether they're flies or mice or, or anything else for that matter. So that really goes back to you know incorporating all the tools that we have. Um, you know we might we may do a cell-based assay and make those mutations in a cell line. You know bef and before we even think about going into mice, um, right. we'll do the computational work behind the scenes to make sure 
um, that we're not just um, you know, taking a, a wild shot in the dark on a hypothesis. They're, they're going to be well thought out. And I think that that's where we have, you know, good regulatory systems in place, not only in the way that we use animals and house animals, but in the way that we do our peer-reviewed um, um, work on our grants. Um, you know, if you're really not putting together a, for, a good hypothesis um, and there's flaws in your experimental design, um, you better believe your review <laughs> the committee will, will tell you that, you know, we're not going to fund you because this is why we think you're wrong and, you yeah. know, here are all of our suggestions and you can go back and, and certainly, you know, resubmit uh, that. And I can, I can picture a day, uh, perhaps 100,000, perhaps uh, sooner, perhaps much longer from now, when a group of the ancestors of a group of uh, escaped transgenic doogie mice with their <laughs> accelerated learning and memory discover the archive of, uh, of hominid research uh, from, from right. through their archaeologists and discover that everything they need to know about curing any disease that uh, befalls them is there in that archive. Uh, right. I think yeah. they'll very much appreciate <laughs> the work that's been done. Yeah, yeah, we're doing a really good job at curing mice of all sorts of things. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I think you know, you know, that's a good point too, because you know, I think in oncology, you know, nothing that statement is more true than than anywhere else. Um, where you know, again, mice aren't humans, and humans aren't mice, and just because you get a positive finding in a mouse, whether it's a neurodegenerative disease or a metabolic disease or an oncology indication. Um, you know, you really have to think about mechanism. You really have to think about your outcome measures and, and look carefully because the mice are telling you um, information. They're, they're not going to, you know, tell you whether or not you have a cure in front of you. And for that, you know, the preclinical model is a way to um, give you confidence to move forward and the more data that you have and the more thoroughly you can interrogate it, and be your worst critic on what is exactly does this mean. Um, you know, are the same biomarkers there? Are the mice dying of the same things or suffering from the same ailments that the human patient population is? Um, so those are the things that you really have to look carefully and be your, your own critic on that. And then I think that we'll get to the point where we really believe that, um, you know, the mice do translate, um, and, you know, and, and, and they will translate if you're watching and listening closely yourself being, you know, maybe overly optimistic, or if it's just not the right, you know, area to be interrogating, um, or the right disease to be modeling, then, you know, you may have to go with, with something a little different. Thank you so much for your time tonight. It's just Absolutely. been wonderful to talk with you about the yeah. work you've been doing and just in general, um, you know, how this all works and the, you know. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to um, have, have been uh, a part of the conversation, and thank you so much for, for having me. This was fun. This was great. And for everyone out there, um, if you want to find out more about the Jackson Laboratory, you can go to, go to jax.org. That is their website. And they're also on Twitter as Jackson Lab. And Kat, I don't know if you're on Twitter or anything, but... It, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was wonderful once again, and thank you for staying up late with us. Not a problem. My pleasure. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Thank you.